I am so glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, my name is Mike. If this is your first time at Risen City or even at church in a while, um, number one, so glad you'd be here and be part of what, of what we're doing. Um, I'm one of the leaders here at the church, and it is my privilege to be in this space of, of teaching and preaching this morning. And um, I, I want to hope I want to let, let you know that um, when we come to church, right, we understand a couple different things. Number one is that we do serve a good God, and so we pray and believe that that life. And, and, and our marriages and our families and our weeks will go well and be blessed by God. But we also recognize that, that we live in a fallen world awaiting its redemption and that life doesn't always go the way we plan. And that sometimes we come into church and, and we put on a face because the week hasn't been awesome, the day hasn't been awesome, even the drive into church sometimes isn't all that awesome. But I want you to know that we believe at Risen City that the church is meant to be a home for the hurting. Home for, for, for the broken, for those who are confused and doubting, questioning and praying and waiting on God. It's a home for those who are in their best season of life or their worst one because the grace of God is given to any and all who would come. It doesn't really matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've been doing, or what season you're in. The grace of God invites us as we are to come to him and truly get to, to know him and, and encounter him. Because see, what we believe is, is that it's our job as the body of Jesus, the body of Christ, the church, not to just have a religious ceremony once a week, but to have a true moment where heaven and earth can collide, where we can encounter this risen Jesus and have our life changed. In fact, the way that we say it here is that we want to be a church that leads people into a soul-changing relationship with Jesus. Not just a once-a-week nicety kind of thing, but a genuine transformation. But that only happens when we get to know him and when we encounter him. Because we believe that, that Jesus ultimately is the greatest source of our soul's healing, wholeness, health, flourishing, life, joy, anything you need in all seasons, it's him. We would even go so far to say, that what you need right now, regardless of who you are and whatever season of life that you are in, is more of Jesus. That that's really what our souls need. And that if we can fix that thing, everything else can begin to sort of fall into alignment. We, we've been in this series called Cultivate where we've been saying essentially this key thing is that the condition of your soul leaks into life. That whatever's going on in here is going to get out. And as Jesus fathers, we come and submit our souls to, to his way and invite his life. And from that place, then go and live ours out. And so what we need is just more of him, more of him in us, and more of his life flowing in our veins. And so we are about that here at Risen City, about creating that. And one of the ways that we get to do that is through this thing called the Bible. Um, now, we do believe that, that this word is not just a book of paper and things and, and you know, ink on a page. It's not some old textbook. It's not some ancient manuscript that's irrelevant and, and, and unneeded for today. We believe that this is a word from our good father for our good, to, to help us find joy and flourishing, to follow after him, to know who he is, to have faith in him. So we're going to open it up today and allow it to challenge us, encourage us, hopefully change us, maybe even convict us a little bit, but ultimately lead us to life. And we're going to do that in the midst of this series called Cultivate. Um, it's a series that we have been looking at that really has this theme of intentional building, really. How do we intentionally build certain parts of our life? And we started with the soul, because that's the most important thing. And then we're sort of focusing in as the major theme on the sort of home, sort of the family, marriage, parenting. We did singleness last week, and we're going to sort of fix our focus today on, on, on some marriage and begin that conversation a little bit. And so whether you're married or not, the statistics are that if you're not married, you're probably going to be. And so figuring out what marriage is, is about is, is paramount ultimately to some of our deepest needs of joy and flourishing. So I want, I want to help us go through this journey a little bit together. So if you do have a Bible, um, I want you to open up to the book of Genesis, book of Genesis chapter 2. If you're unfamiliar with, with the Bible, Genesis is the first book. Um, you can find it pretty easy, and don't be afraid to still use the, you know, the table of context if you need to, um, but it's the first one, so you can turn there. It is going to be on the screen behind me. We're going to be reading starting in verse 15, and, and just to set this up, just so we know that this is a story found um, in the beginning of the book, so this is, and this is before what Christians call the fall, when we sort of rebelled against God and chose to sort of push him away and do our own thing and live for the glory of ourselves. so this was before sin broke what God made. All right, starting in verse 15, it says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may eat surely of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. 
I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whenever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs closed up the place with its, and closed up its place with flesh. And, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. Let's all say that. One flesh. And the best verse. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, um, there's a certain kind of person that I just don't get. <sighs> there are a lot of types of people I don't get, to be honest. But I still love them. And it, it shows more about my issues than theirs. But like, and if you're one of these people, you know, I love you, I do. Um, but like, the, the kinds of people who, who, for a fun activity, thinking, just driving is that. Ever have, have these people who are like, let's just go for a drive. That is so annoying, right? Because where are we going? Right? It's like, no, let's just get the car and drive. And I'm thinking, waste of gas, where are we having to get to? Like, because like, there's always, I, 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 just, I have this thought, there's always this underlying motive. Like, if you just want to go to Dairy Queen, just tell me that so we can get there faster, not to go the scenic route. Like, I'm not one who necessarily wants to just, I can't say that, spend their time in a way that I consider unwise for the right to go on this, this journey to get to some place that I don't even know if it exists or not. Like, I have to make a decision as soon as I leave my parking lot, right, left or right. And people are like, just, just choose. I don't want to choose. We're going on a journey, right? I want to, I want to get somewhere. And it sort of ties into to my thoughts about, about being lost. I don't know if you're someone like that where, like, if I have to go somewhere, if I know where I'm going, right, I will look at the map like a million times over. Right? I know every which way, and then if construction shows up that's not on the map, that's like the day that my mind just breaks down. Like, I probably, like, get extra grace in the car at that moment because if I didn't, I don't know what Jesus would, would do with me. And it's just this, this thing because if I don't know where to get where I'm going, it stresses me out. So even the thought of a nicety kind of like little moment of, of spontaneity is not fun for me. Right? I mean, it's fun for you, right? Like, that's awesome. I would consider the fact that you need prayer. But like, uh, but I'm sure my wife, because she's one of those people, would think that I do, right? But the thing about it, the thing about it is the reason why, why, why this is important is because if, 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 I, if I don't know where I'm going, I just don't know how to get there. And that stresses me out. Probably because I have some control issues. Like, I'm just going to be, be vulnerable, right? But, like, in general, right, part of the problem is that if we don't always know where we're going, we don't know how to get to that space. And that's so true of, of marriage. Here's the thing. If we don't know what, what, what marriage is meant to be, the vision of what marriage is, we will never go in that direction. We, and we sort of said the same thing about our souls a few weeks ago if you were here, that part of the ways that we cultivate a healthy soul is by first catching the vision of God for your life. Figure out what he wants to see, where he wants to take you, which we said, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not yet, that, that he wants to make you look like Jesus. You have the peace, the patience, the kindness, the faith, the fortitude, the, 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 the perseverance of Jesus, and that's the best thing for our soul. In the same way, it's true for your marriage. That what you need to do today is capture and understand the vision that God has for your marriage so that you can work towards it. Because here's the thing, you will cultivate some kind of marriage. The question is whether it's going to be the godly kind or not, whether it's going to be a flourishing kind or not, right? So when you think of your marriage, even if you're not married here today, but you want to be one day, when you picture marriage in your mind, when you see yourself in 50 years from now, what does that look like? What is that goal? What is the destination? Hear me today. If it does not align with what God has said, number one, you're wrong in it. Number two, there's better for you. And that's what I want to present today as we go on this journey, is to start in this place of, of casting this vision of what marriage is actually meant to be in, 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 in the ways of God. Because at a basic level, at a basic level, most of us in this room, I would argue, sort of know this, this thing called marriage. 
right? We know it's this relationship that you enter into. There's this big ceremony. Usually it's, you know, you find someone, you fall in love, you get a ring, you have this wedding, you become husband and wife, you move, you, you move in, you make kids, you have this thing. It's like, like, you just check the list down. It's just this relationship that I have to get into. Here's the problem. If that's the case, if that's the case, then we do not give it the kind of attention that it deserves. Here's why. Because it's so much deeper than just a checklist on my adulting. All right? and, here's, and here's even the more powerful thing. If I don't think deeply about what marriage is, I will never catch the bad ideas I bring to it, the broken ideas I function in. Like last week, when, when we, if you were here, we said that spouses aren't saviors, right? that, that marriage doesn't fix me, that it's not meant to complete me, that it actually exposes me, that Jesus is the place of my salvation ultimately. But if I don't think deeply enough about that, I'll go into my marriage assuming my spouse is that. And they get disappointed and make some bad decisions. So for us, we need to sort of get to this place where we understand what marriage is. And as much as marriage gets sort of overlooked and pushed to the back burner in culture, we the church need to understand it deeply, 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 because God says that we are to hold it in high honor. In fact, in, in, in the book of Hebrews, we are told to uphold marriage to high, with high esteem, to value it and keep it pure, to understand its nature and love it. That there's so many layers in it. Because what God did for us in marriage, in fact, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's a place where God works for your flourishing. Like if you're in the room and you are married, God wants to use that union to flourish your soul. To bring you deep joy. To make you holy. To make you like him. And even, as we're going to see in a moment, Paul says that, that it's to express the nature of the gospel through your relationship. But there are layers to this thing that we don't often access. And I want to help us get there to us today. But here's the first thing we have to see, is that marriage in and of itself is a sacred thing that we need to love. See, right when, in, 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 in the beginning, what we were reading a little bit today is that we begin to see it. It's because marriage, marriage is not just some human invention. It's not just some social convention that we made up that we can take or leave and, and change and just leave behind us if we, if we don't like it anymore. There's actually something divine in it. There is, there, there is a holy idea, because hear me today, that it was given to us before the fall ever happened. Like you could argue uh, that there were four things, four things. I don't have time to get into them all today. I wish I could. Four things that God instituted before the fall, before human sin broke the world and, and made a separation between us and God and, and forced this, this thing that, 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 is, that is broken in us and around us. There were four things he made holy or sacred. Number one was a relationship with him, that we walked with him. That was, that was the first thing. It's the highest thing in our life. Number two was life itself, that we were made in his image, that life is inherently sacred and we honor and we love it. Number three was work. That God gave Adam a job before the fall ever happened, by the way. So your job is not the enemy. Maybe your attitude is. Number four, no, no, number four was marriage and sex. That these were given before the fall ever happened. That God instituted as a divine idea, which is why for us marriage is such a big deal. Because it's not just a thing, it's a sacred thing. That, there, that, that, that there's things in, in this idea of marriage, the idea of family and society and children and sex and romance and all these different components that get put together in this divine idea given by God to humanity for our good. And what we read today in, in Genesis is sort of the first place that we actually see this happening. It's the story where God institutes marriage in such a beautiful, beautiful way. And so he has Adam, right? He's there and he makes him, he forms him, gives him this job to be the, essentially the caretaker of creation. That's what we are as humanity, the caretakers of what God made good. That we are to foster it, cultivate it, grow it, use our gifts, our talents, our abilities to steward what God made. And then God says something interesting. He says, well, it's not good for him to be alone in this, so I'm going to make him a helper. And then he brings all these animals to him, and he names all these animals, because in naming, you have to, like, see into the soul of this thing and identify it and know it. There's a very powerful spiritual thing that we're not going to get into today about that, right? And then God's like, well, there was not a good one for him, so I'll have to make him another. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But, like, when I used to read this story, I was always a little bit confused. Like, I don't know if you're tracking with me on this one, but, like, God's like, it's not good to be alone, so I'm going to bring all these animals, and that made sense to me, right? Like, was God trying to hook him up with the jaguar? Like, that, that's just what it felt like. I just didn't really understand what he was going on. But hear me today. This is the significant thing, right? It was God who said it was not good for man to be alone, not Adam. And so what God was doing was making sure Adam knew his own loneliness. Adam was making, that God was making sure that Adam recognized his need for the partner because Adam by himself often would function by himself. 
And so God brings all these animals, and there's nothing good, obviously, in them for him. So he recognizes, hey, there's not one that I need so that not only can God say it's not good to be alone, but Adam can recognize, it's not good for me to be alone. And all the men said, amen, right? And then, and then, and then Adam goes into this deep sleep, as we heard, and God takes what's interesting to this rib. If you've been in so Sunday school, all you know the story, and he begins to build this woman out of it, which, by the way, by, by the way, is a beautiful picture of the nature of the relationships of our genders. I want you to understand this today, that there is this unity of source, yet uniqueness of expression in the human, in the human race. And we see it right here that it was taken from him. And by the way, gentlemen, Right? What this speaks to is also your native desire to protect. And I want you to get this today. That your manhood is defined by how well you flourish the woman in your life. How well you treat her like the rib that she was made from. You want to be a man, learn how to flourish people. And we see this here, and then, and then this is the beautiful thing, because like a dad on a wedding day, like I can't even imagine, it's, it's like, it, it's too much for me to think about that I have to do this, right, with my beautiful little girl, but like walking this, this girl down the aisle and presenting her to the bridegroom, God literally does this with Eve. He makes her, he forms her, and he walks her down and presents her to Adam, and his reaction's beautiful. He starts singing. He starts serenading, in fact, worshiping in this weird sort of romantic, God-centered, Eve-focused moment. It's this beautiful expression of desire and honor. And I hope, I hope the guy could sing because that would be a real awkward moment. Can we be real? Right? Like, like I don't know about you, but I've been at some weddings where, for some reason, grooms think that it is romantic to serenade their bride when they cannot sing. Like, like, it's so cringy, I can't even watch. Like, I, like I, my wife used to do wedding photography, so I go to a lot of these weddings. And I have, like, literally images burned into my head of these grooms who would get, all, get up and, and think it's just like a surprise. The bride doesn't know about it because if she did, she'd say no, right? And he gets up there and grabs his mic and has this whole moment. And it's so bad, I literally have to turn away. Like, I, like, I don't know if that's an issue with me, but, like, if there's embarrassing things even on TV, I can't watch. Like, I can't, I can't enter in that. But this is worse than that, right? It's just it's so bad. So here's some tips, grooms in the room if you ever want to get married don't sing like seriously like unless someone unless someone who's not your mom or your bride says you can sing don't do it like because they're blinded by love and probably tell you way better than you are and if she wants to hear it she'll want to hear it later so save us the guests all the pain of that of the mental image and just don't do it like just don't do it but I, I think I think in this case Adam being the first human he probably had a best voice ever right he probably had a perfect pitch and all that stuff and sang like an angel but 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 so he sings in this moment and, and then they, there's this response there's this awesome little thing and, 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 and then we begin to see what God actually has a heart for in marriage because right after this moment of romance, of, of love, of expression, of, of, of desire, God says, and so, a man will leave his mom and dad, grow up, stop being childish, hopefully sooner than later, cling to his wife, and this is key, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. That what was divided is now united again. That the word separate is now functioning as one. That, 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 that there's a uniqueness here that is now unified, again, in this marriage covenant. And by the way, a covenant, right, a covenant is this selfless promise for the good of the other regardless, period. That there is this, that there's this thing that God says, that in fact, all that stuff that God's spoken up to this point about the nature of this relationship, that Adam's not good alone, that he needs a partner in this calling, he needs a helper, which, by the way, women, the, the, the word there gets so torn up. It's not a bad word. God calls himself the helper of humanity, right? It's actually a title of, of honor and strength, by the way, because I, mean, I know we always miss that for some reason. And he says that, and all this, though, gets summed up in this two little words, one flesh. That's the point. That's what marriage actually is. This one flesh covenant that I'm going to vow, I'm going to promise at the beginning of this relationship, before you've sinned, before you've failed, before you've hurt me, before I'm disappointed, I'm going to vow to work, to love, to serve, to honor, pursue, to be for you forever, because that's what this thing is to be selflessly in this committed to the end, monogamous relationship forever. In fact, Paul even says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, that in speaking of marriage, we actually reflect the mystery of how God loves you. That what we were singing today about how, how we are who he says he is and, and, and that we are just his children, that he is for us. And when we sing reckless love and all those songs, that is what's supposed to be displayed in your 
marriage, that there is a reckless, scandalous, almost illogical commitment to the good of the other person that I am saying I am for you forever until this thing ends in death. I'm committed to your flourishing. I'm committed to your joy. I'm committed to your soul. And the only thing that's going to break this is death itself. See, 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 marriage is not some partnership of tasks, not some convenient relationship. It is a soul level, one flesh union that starts to form, which by the way, here in lies the framework of the Christian sexual ethic. We talked about this briefly last week, right? That there's one yes and a whole lot of no's, right? One yes being marriage. It's because of this for straight fact right here, that sexuality in, in the Christian understanding is the avenue by which the one flesh union is embodied in life, formed and repeated, that it's, it's kept up in this place. That in fact, you could think of sex as a sacredly unifying embodiment of what's happening in the soul, that, that I would go so far to put it like this, that sex, when you're married, is the ceremony of the wedding day happening again and again and again and again forever. That when you as a spouse come together with your wife, what you are saying, or with your husband, if you're a woman, all that stuff, right, is what you are saying is this, that I am still yours, that we are still one, that when we engage in this sexual kind of relationship, what is happening is I'm reminding my partner, I'm reminding my spouse that I'm for you, I'm with you, I'm yours to the end, you have all of me, everything about me is for you, it's poured that direction, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to keep you, I'm going to stand by you, because we are one, you are like me, we are, we are united, and this is how I'm going to tell you that, that sex, hear me today, is not about you at all. The fact that you get some pleasure out of it is glory to God. We can sing some worship songs about that. But the thing about it, it's not, a, it's not even about you at all. It's saying to your spouse, I am still fully yours. I'm yours. Because this is what we begin to see is that, is that sexuality, right, is not some simple appetite that we have this desire to fulfill in partners and conquest. Here's what it is. It's a spiritual activity as much as it is physical. That when you engage in sex, you engage in soul weaving. That's, it's person mingling. That there's something in the depth of this that we have to understand that's beautiful and it's good. The church makes it seem so bad all the time, but it's not. It's actually glorious and it's wonderful. Like God made it and it's a good thing that we can be excited about when we get married. Hear me say, it's a good thing, but it's soul weaving. And I, and I want to make sure we understand the dynamics of this. This is why Jesus, when he said, what God has joined, let no man pull apart, no man separate, because it's not just bodies separating, it's souls tearing apart. And some of you have felt that and you know that, yet you ignore it. But that's the nature of what this is meant to be. It's a sacred act of coming together, being full of vulnerability, intimacy, naked of body and soul. So what this means for us as Christians, hear me today, is that if you are not willing to have the fullness of vulnerability of my emotions, of my mind, of my soul, of my finances, of my future, and of my hopes, you don't deserve the body. If you want that, you get everything else because that's what the picture is, that we are one flesh in all things. You can't have one little aspect of me. You get all of me. That's why it's protected. That's why we call it sacred. That's why it's unified around this thing because the kind of vulnerability that's meant to be protected here is held up by this thing called covenant of I'm with you to the end so you can be real with me. And so as your pastor, if you're married in the room today, you should be having sex. Hear the word of God. Seriously, right? Like, I don't want to scandalize the issue, but like outside of the normal ebbs and flows of life, right, where, you know, there's medical issues, there's pregnancy issues, there's busyness, there's whatever, you should be, if you're not having it, and you could be, I would go so far to say that's a sinful thing in your marriage. That, that I, want, I want to encourage you today that as sort of fits the, the language and the style and the, and the needs of your marriage, you should be engaging in a hymn If you are not, talk to someone. This is something that we've done a horrible job in the church. We've privatized this kind of relationship so much that I can't even express some of the questions I might have to someone in a safe environment. That we've privatized our sexuality so much that even in church we won't talk about it. So if you are someone who's struggling in this area, hear me say, go find a trusted couple and talk to them. If you're newly married, if you're going to be married, have the conversations because here's what will happen. People will suffer in silence if we don't open up the conversation. Questions will go unanswered, expectations will go unsaid, and then unmet, and then conflict rises. Because it's, it's not as glorious sometimes as the TV light, light likes to present it. 
Sometimes it's messy and confusing and we have to figure this whole thing out. It's glorious and it's beautiful, but sometimes it doesn't work right. But if we can't talk about it, how are we going to know? So I want to invite us into a community, as awkward as this might be, that if you are married and if you're in that place and you're struggling, invite someone into that. Talk about it. Ask the questions. And if you're going to be married, talk about it in a safe place that's not going to make you struggle too much later. Because we've got to be wise about it. But as your pastor, married people, hear the word of God. Have sex. I'm, su- I'm surprised there was not more reaction to that. Like, I'm just saying, right? Like, like, if you get one thing, the pastor said, I can have sex. Yes, if you're married, go do it. And hear me today. I'd even challenge you as much as your life allows. Because why would I not want to engage in a space that's going to remind my spouse that I'm theirs forever? The only reason in the Bible, hear me today, where, where, where we are given license to not engage together in a non-sinful way is in prayer. So if you aren't having sex because you're praying a lot, cool, right? But even Paul says after that, stop and get together so the devil has no foothold in your marriage. So just put it out there, engage together. But back to the point. Here's the question I have, and here's where we need to go, right? Is, is when we describe marriage at the beginning, before we get on this whole sex conversation that needed to happen, um, does your marriage line up with that? That's the question. When you think of marriage and view marriage, is, is it broken or is it beautiful? Like, like, is the marriage you hope for and the marriage that you currently have, is it the place of deepest flourishing in your life? Is, it, is, is, is that a place of joy, of intimacy, deepest friendship and love? Is it the place you love running to and having? Is it a place where people looked in, they would see the gospel being preached without you ever speaking a word? Is that your marriage? That is the question. Are you loving like this? And obviously... I know the answer to that question. It was setting you up. The answer is no. Sometimes, at best, most often no. Why? Because we're human and we're broken and we're sinful and we often don't put the work in required. So this is what we need to begin to understand here today. That I, I want you to understand it from me to you this. is this, that I actually believe that we could have these kind of marriages on earth. That this is not just some ideal thing in the future that when all things get made right, this is right now we could have these kind of Jesus-centered, loving, flourishing relationships if we would commit to cultivate them. That's the biggest thing. Most of us are too lazy in our relationships to do the work required because I want you to understand this. Marriage is romance at work. That's what it is. So if we do this, I want you to understand that this can actually happen to a greater degree than I believe that most often we would succumb to. So I want to challenge us to say, get your aim higher. If you're married, if you're going to be married, get your aim higher for what it could be. Not unrealistic, but faithful. Look into what it could be. Look into what could come in your house, in your marriage, because guess what? It's going to affect your kids. The home that you will create starts with, with that relationship. And so I want to challenge us to say that even as culture and things sort of give up on marriage, the church should never do that. And yes, let's be honest, there are situations upon which marriages will fail. We are human beings. There is sin. Right? The Bible does give concessions for these things. So the, do marriages need to fall apart? Yes, some of them do. But for the general person, let's get our aim a little bit higher. Let's hope a little bit deeper and work a little harder to see God's glory in our marriages, which is going to be the aim of the next three weeks of how do we do that? If this is the vision of what marriage is meant to be, how do we work towards that place? And that's what I want to talk about for today, next week, and then we'll end in the third week and really begin to peel this apart a little bit. And so today it starts here. It starts here. Number one is that you need to cultivate your soul. That one should have been obvious, right? We've been saying it every single week. That in here we say it's not optional. If you want a healthy marriage, you must have a healthy soul. There's no, there's no sort of shortcut there. There's no other thing. That the health of your marriage will be a reflection of the health of your soul. And hear me today. What your spouse needs is not more of you and your mess, but more of you looking like Jesus. So if you want to love your spouse, start cultivating health right here. Because that will be the number one thing that gets you to the place you need to go. Because everything else I say doesn't matter if you're not willing to do this. So spouses in the room. People who are single, you have an opportunity. Cultivate this. Start here. And one of the first things from this place then is, is, is I, want to, I want to give us two ideas, just two, just two ideas today. Is number one is this. First thing we need to do from cultivating our soul 
is cultivating the covenant mindset. Cultivating the covenant mindset. See, because here's the problem. As much as we say this, what, what we never really do is bring the covenantal idea into the covenantal practice. We will have a theology of marriage that doesn't affect my home. And so I want to make sure we, we sort of remove that bridge and say, you know what, if we're going to call this thing a covenant, I'm going to act, think, and do what the covenant requires of me. But here's the problem. As human beings, we have a fundamental problem with this because we really love ourselves. Selfishness is at the heart as the enemy of what God wants for your marriage. Hear me today. It's the antithesis of a healthy, God-glorifying marriage is this thing called selfishness. Because hear me today, you can't really have a selfless, permanent, monogamous, faithful, scandalously, radically in love kind of covenant if you're all about yourself. The kind of, of intimacy that's meant to be built in a marriage, the kind of vulnerability that's meant to be protected in this covenant cannot happen if you're always first thinking about me and what I want. And if this is the case, then I believe for most of us it actually is. Hear me today. Then what you have is not a marriage. What you have is a mutually beneficial relational contract. As long as these two parties work it out, it's good. Because here's the thing. Have you ever signed a contract before? Most of us probably have, right? Whether it's a phone contract, a work contract, whatever, right? It's this mechanism by which two parties get what they need, right? It's inherently based in fear and mistrust and selfishness. In a business, that probably works. In marriage, it doesn't. Because, see, a contractual mindset believes that if I get mine, then I will give theirs. A covenantal mindset is this. I'm going to ensure they get theirs, period. See, this is the difference we need to begin seeing. Covenantal mindset is based in service, not in fear. It's based in love, not in selfishness. It's not afraid to not get its needs met. It's afraid to not meet the needs of someone else. That's what it, it's this kind of love, which, by the way, we need to define what love is quickly. Love truly is not only the desire, but also the work for good of someone else. That I generally want good for them, and I work for it. So in the case of marriage, case of covenantal love, it's that I desire and work for the good of my spouse, even at the expense of myself. That's the vision. That's the hope, right? But that cannot happen if all I am thinking is how do I get mine? How do, how do I get my stuff? How does this benefit me? Contractual thinking is in its nature temporary and insecure because implicit in it is the moment this stops working, I'm done. So you better be in your best behavior. Hope you can see how that's not good for marriage. See, this is the problem. And it comes out often in our minds. We, don't, we won't ever really verbalize this unless we get to a point where it's super strained. But it's this. It'll start thinking like this. Well, if, if my husband would just do X, then I'll do Y. If they'll do A, B, and C, then I will do 1, 2, and 3. If she would just do this, then I will give her that. If, then. If, then. If this is beneficial to me, then I'll respond with, with benefit. And the problem, the implicit problem here is that the moment that it stops being per, being at least perceived by my end of it as, as beneficial, I'm done, I'm out. I'm no longer happy in this marriage. I, the, they must have not been my soulmate. This wasn't what I expected. I'm no longer happy. I fell out of love. Hear me today. You don't fall out of love, you walk away from it. You don't fall out of love, you don't cultivate it. There are circumstances, don't get me wrong, of abuse, of abandonment, of, of serial adultery, where it's not that. There, there are those cases. The Bible gives a lot of room for that. But for the general person, the reason why your marriage sucks is because you don't serve and sacrifice for the good of the other person. Hear me today. That's what it is. We stop giving because all I can think about is me and what I want and what I can have. And when that goes well, then that's what I, I want to have. But we all know this is not the hope of marriage. Even if you're not a Christian, hear me today. Because why? Hear me, hear me. Every classic love song, speaks and sings of this permanent kind of affectionate love where I'm in this forever, no matter what. Why do you think The Notebook is so popular, right? Yes, it's fictional, but why? It speaks this kind of deep beauty and permanence that through all these things, they remained. And a marriage that will last 70 years full of life, truth, grace, and love, joy, and flourishing gets this and understands this, that a one flesh union is guarded by selfless love. Selfless love. And a lot of us, here's where it begins to, to hit the road a little bit because we've been trained to believe that marriage is 50 50. 50 50 is depressing. Depressing. 
50-50 is, is, is contractual. 50-50 says you better earn my love. How do you live an intimate lifestyle when I'm always on the edge of having to earn it or lose it? It's impossible. That's called religion. That's what we reject fundamentally as Christians. Right? 50-50 allows for me to always have my foot sort of out the door. Promissory, covenantal, selfless love is nothing like that. It's a regardless kind of love. I want you to get this and lean into this if you're married. It is a love that says this. I'm in 100% period. Nothing else. No exceptions. No clauses. Period. My work is for you. And I'm going to love you by assuming you're going to fail me in love anyway. I want, like we have to understand this. It is a love that looks in the soul of my partner, my spouse, and says, you will hurt me. You will fail me. You will disappoint me, and I'm going to disappoint you, but I'm more committed to us at 70 than your momentary performance, and so I'm going to be the best partner you got in the progress of your soul, that the marriage covenant is commitment to the progress of Christ's likeness in each other. It assumes failure, and then loves in spite of it. It's a love on the other side of sin. See, covenantal thinking is honest and gives space to be human because I realize that, that you are not my sole completer. We are partners, and I'm for you. I'm with you, and I want you. And I, and I want you. The marital love, the marital love is furious. It is reckless. It's scandalous. It's radical, and outside the church, it doesn't make sense. Like, if your love doesn't make people question what's going on there, it's not the, Bible, the Bible's vision for your marriage. And all of us need to repent of that if we're married. See, here, 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 here's the issue. As I said, most general, generally speaking, minus all the exceptions, which we all looking to be the exception, you're probably not. Our marriages will fail because we stop serving, because we stop sacrificing, hear me, and we begin keeping score. Begin keeping score. And as cliche as this is about to sound, it's so true. When you keep score, no one wins. No one wins. How do I know that you're keeping score? Because you ask this question. Well, who goes first? Who's the first one to start pursuing again? Who's the first one to forgive? Who's the first one to initiate? If you ever think about this, who's the first one? You've already lost the battle. I want you to understand that today. In a marriage in its ideal form, no one asks who goes first because I'm both assuming it's going to be me. Here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing about it. If both people would just assume that I go first, I love first, I serve first, both people get loved and served. It's when we stop doing that and start waiting for the other person to pick up their end of it that no one actually gets loved. So if you've been thinking in your marriage today, well, when they start doing it, you've already lost. So pick it up and start doing it for them, regardless if they love you back right, regardless if they even can love you back right right now, because your love is meant to be bigger than their current season. Marriage is meant to be covenantal, but then it's also meant to be complementary. The thought number two is you have a complementary mindset. We said this a few weeks ago, if you were, or last week, I guess, is, is, that, is that marriage, right, is not to meant to be my completer, but my complement. And we recognize this dynamic outside of marriage all the time in all different types of areas of life. We call them dynamic duos or power couples, right? Like in fiction, in fiction, right? You know, they got like Sam and Frodo, right? Power couple. Anyone over Lord of the Rings here? Like I thought that would hit a little bit deeper than that, but I guess not. All right. Um, Batman and Robin, right? We got Batman and Robin, right? Um, or even in sports, right? Even sports. I was wanting to reference the Raptors, but like, come on, right? I can't do that now. And I was trying to think of hockey. Like, literally, I couldn't think of any hockey wins. The last, this is a funny thing. When I was thinking about this, I started thinking, what is like a dynamic duo that I have in hockey? The first person that came to, came to my mind was Mario Lemieux and Yarmer Yager. If that means anything to you, then you understand why that's crazy, because that was so long ago. I don't even know anyone right now. Like, uh, Crosby and Malkin, maybe? Like, is that, is that legit? I don't, even, I don't even know. Yeah, I'm getting the nod. Like that, right? Or even, or, or even in food, right? Now, you guys know I like cooking and like eating, right? It, it, like, like, like peanut butter and honey, right? Like it's classic, right? Chocolate and bananas, chocolate and strawberries, chocolate and uh, oranges, chocolate and pineapple, chocolate with about anything is pretty good, right? Bread and butter, 
right? Beef and mushrooms, lamb and mint jelly. Come on. Like this is things that, we, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, here's the thing, right? right? They are delicious not because they're the same, because they're combined right to produce this dish. Amen. Same is true of you and your spouse. That there's, you're actually meant to honor the uniqueness that God has formed, but yet the unity in that place. That you are not called to be the same person that you have different gifts and talents and abilities and God has brought you together, that you can complete more in that mission, more in that marriage than you could by yourself. Now, just be fair. Last week we did speak about this, that there are those who are called to prolong singleness and God gives grace for that. For the general person who is probably gonna be married, right? You have to understand this, that when God joins you together, it's because in your uniquenesses as functioning in this one flesh place, you are meant to produce more joy and greater flourishing and more calling succeeding than, all, than by yourself. But it means you need to recognize those things and honor them. That you are equal of value, yet function in different ways. A left hand and a right hand. You're not called to be simply just the same, this, this, this homogenous thing, but you are unique yet unified. And it especially gets seen when kids start showing up in different seasons of life. We've got to begin playing tag team and figuring this whole thing out. But I want to say this because this will be a thing that, that's going to come up a bunch. It's, it's gentlemen in the room today. Right? Um, God calls you the head of this marriage, which means this. Not, not that you have power but that God holds you responsible. I want you to understand this today. Right? It might not be your fault, the condition of your marriage, but it is your responsibility, and God will come to you first like he did Adam in the garden. And normal men will blame shift. We're going to talk about that next week. So don't be a normal guy. Because I will honestly say this today. You don't deserve respect unless your wife is flourishing. I don't care how macho you are. I don't care what, what you can do or what you cannot do. If your wife does not flourish, she becomes the definition of the success of your manhood. Understand this, that God will not listen to your prayers if you don't honor her. That's what 1 Peter tells us. He doesn't say that to the women, but to you. They understand that. So guess what, Really? Who goes first all the time? You better. There's the question answered for you. Don't wait. I don't want God to ignore me. So we go first. Keep it simple for today. It's this. If you get married and when you get married, you become someone's life partner to help them become all they've been called to be. You're their complement. But I said something there on purpose. I don't know if you caught it. I didn't say you get a life partner. I said you become one because the covenant's not about you. It's about them. I want to make them flourish. And if, and if I have two people in this marriage who are pursuing and fighting for the flourishing of the other, guess who flourishes? Both of them. Ben, you guys can come back up. I want to end with this thought today. If, if you want to cultivate a healthy marriage, even if you're single, right? kill selfishness. This will be the big thing that comes up throughout the rest of this week. So we talk about communication and pursuit and sin and bitterness and things. It's this. If you can't get over yourself, you will not build a healthy marriage. I, I need the, the selfishness in me to actually die. That marriage is not about me. And if you're thinking here today, well, you know what, Mike? You know, that sounds good in, 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 as an idea. But like in reality, come on. Can I tell you, know, you're right. It sounds too good to be true. It's, in fact, our sin makes it impossible. We just have to have a conversation quick, right? And it's true. Our sin makes this impossible. Marriage is hard by itself. We throw in our sin, it's even harder. But no one promised that marriage is going to be easy, right? Marriage is hard work. It's a lot of hard work. It's romance at work. It's choosing every single day to cultivate towards the health of this thing, to put myself down, to say it's not about me. How do I serve them? How do I honor them? How do I make them know what's up? That is what this call is. It is impossible. I, I, I can't do it by myself. And this is why, hear me today, we actually need 
the hope of this gospel, if our marriages are ever going to reflect the kind of scandalous love that Jesus has for us, we better know it. You can't love like God demands of us if you don't know how much you are already loved. I need the hope of Jesus to be true. That means my sin is forgiven and that I'm set free from it because if my sin is not forgiven and I'm not set free from my selfishness, then there is no hope for me, really. I might have a decent marriage that we get along but the thriving, joyful, soulful, intimate marriage that God designs for you and for your spouse can only happen when Jesus becomes the thing that drives my heart, when He becomes the vision that drives my mind, when His love is the thing that's filled me because the love that's demanded cannot be made up. It has to overflow. John says we love because we've first been loved. This is the secret. If you want to be a good spouse, Get to know the gospel so well. Because what's the story? When I didn't deserve it, when I couldn't earn it, when I wasn't enough, when I was unworthy, God did everything to pursue me, to chase me, to form me, to heal, heal me, to progress me, and make me like him. And so go do likewise with your spouse. That's the point. But you cannot do that if you're trying to make that love up. You can't. The love is too impossible. It's so amazing, this goodness of God. And yet you were called to reflect it in your life. The story of, of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, right, is that when I was lost, he found me. That when I wandered, he chased me. That when I ran away, he pursued me. That when I was unworthy, he called me his own. When I was undeserving, he said, take my whole kingdom. No, no, when I couldn't impress him, he said, well, take my blood. I'll spill it for you. When I couldn't be perfect, he said, I'll, I'll forgive that. God, I, I can't be enough. It's okay. I got you. God, I, I have nothing to bring. Don't worry. I brought it all. But I can't, I, can't, I can't give you anything else. I'll take whatever you got. That's the gospel. He's already done the work. And so if I understand today that he's done all that my soul is craving, I can love freely because my spouse is not the source of that love for me anymore. If you want a healthy marriage, get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Because here's the thing. Religion. This is crazy. Religion that often drives a heart says this. You must be good enough. You must earn it. You don't deserve it, so work really hard. But Jesus says, just come. Religion is contractual and Jesus is covenantal. So you can't change your mindset until, until you know the one who can reform your mind. If you're here today and you, and you don't know Jesus, whether you're married or not, I, I want to make this moment clear for you. That the sin that is in your heart does break the heart of God. That he takes it serious. He hates our selfishness. He doesn't want us to live in perpetual brokenness because that separates us from Him and from the life He offered. And ultimately left unchecked, we will be separated from Him forever. But He made a way because He's rich in mercy and great in love that Jesus came and took the pain, took the, the justice, put Himself on a cross, died the death we deserve and rose through your life to give us the life of heaven even in this earthly body. And if you would trust in Him, follow him and choose to believe that you are not your past you are not your sin but you are who he says you are in the love and the grace of Jesus today can be a day where not only do you have a new identity but you get a new birth Jesus says a new life an invitation to wholeness and freedom so please I implore you I beg you this is the best news you ever hear that Jesus offers you life right now you don't have to wait for it if you're here today and you are married, does your marriage reflect the gospel? Does it? If you're married here today and you know that things aren't what they should be, maybe you're not even married in your soul and you can feel the tension God's been speaking to you. Today is the day when we're in the presence of King Jesus and you need to get right. I want to invite you to stand with me today. Would you stand up?